Hello everybody, uh, welcome to episode two of Ask the Farmer. Uh, change the setting up a little bit. You can see we're out here in the cotton field. Uh, Zach's over there spraying. Right now we're making, uh, I think this is our fifth uh, application of uh, pesticides for insects. Uh, as you can tell, the cotton looks good, but it's not good. It would be good if it was about three weeks ago, but right now we're about two weeks away from the last effective bloom date and the cotton just really started blooming last week so we've basically got three weeks to set a crop i'll expand more on that in a later video as we get closer to that august august 15th but uh, anyway uh, i'm out here running the water truck because uh this morning we had a uh, film crew out on our farm again uh yeah we're coming back to the big screen uh, not something real big or in depth but we did a uh, uh, we did a segment for the 700 Club that comes on on uh, CBN talking about uh, my combine accident last fall and how, you know, God Bruce intervened and saved my life. You know, just talk, talking about that. So that'll probably be coming out. They tell me probably be coming out sometime in September. So be uh, looking for that when it does come out where you find out what the link's going to be. You know, it'll be on the, the CBN network, also be on YouTube and a couple, couple other different media outlets. But, uh, but keep watch of the community comment page on, on our channel, and I'll uh, give you more details about it as it, as it comes out. So anyway, let's get to the questions. We, had a, a, we answered five awesome questions in the first video. I'd like to get through another four or five, just depending on how long it takes to answer some of these questions. So the first question we got today is uh, from Gary... Saint Romain, I was sorry if I didn't pronounce that right, but uh, he asked, uh, some farmers spray fungicides when they're corn tassels, but I've noticed most farmers in my area over the last three years don't spray liquid fungicides at tassel. Rather they have some, cop, uh, rather they have some crop dusters top dress some dry granules over their corn when it tassels. Is the dry, is the, are the dry granules just another form of fungicide or something completely different? Well, Gary, uh, you're right. It is something completely different. It's not a fungicide. Chemicals are not applied to crops in dry form. It's always mixed with water to get a uniform coverage. This isn't like the crop, the, the crop dusters way back in the mid 19, uh, the mid, mid 1900s where they would like, uh, you know, broadcast a powder over the over the crop. It's not like that anymore. Any chemicals that are applied now, to my knowledge, are applied in liquid form and mixed mixed with water. So probably what you're seeing most likely is uh, uh, not a fungicide that's being applied, but uh, the crop dusters are coming in and applying a fertilizer application. Most likely going to be nitrogen, probably either urea or ammonium nitrate or ammonium sulfate, something like that, just to supplement uh, the, the for fertility program for their farm and trying to achieve uh, top yields. Because uh, corn is a big user of nitrogen. On average, it typically takes somewhere around one pound of nitrogen to produce one bushel of corn. All the forms of nitrogen that we use, uh, we don't use any anhydrous, but the dry and the liquid forms of nitrogen we use are anywhere from 32 to 48 percent nitrogen. So even the ones that are 48 percent nitrogen, we'd have to apply almost two pounds of product to get one pound of nitrogen. And uh, nitrogen is a is a is an anion. That means it really does it doesn't bind to soil particles. It's once it's incorporated into the ground with rainfall, it's in the soil solution, and there's really nothing to keep that fertilizer from moving on down through the profile and getting down below the, the rooting zone as, as it moves with the water flow through the ground. That's a process that we call leaching. And uh, it's, a, it's, a real, it's a real problem. Nitrogen is not cheap and all that which you apply, you want the plant to be able to take, take up. But the problem with corn is, is that, you know, once corn gets about this tall, it rapidly grows. And you know, once it gets up this tall, there's not that many machines that are capable of going through the corn crop without damaging it and applying either chemicals or fertilizer. So most farmers uh, have to apply their uh, nitrogen earlier in the season than what the corn needs it and hoping that they don't get too much rain to where it's lost down into the soil, soil profile. Uh, typically, uh, farmers will apply two applications of nitrogen, one 
uh, uh, right at planting or right before planting just to try and get the corn crop up and going. It's typically not a, not a heavy rate. And then, uh, you know, typically when corn is uh, between ankle and knee tall, will come in what they call a side dress application nitrogen where they will apply the rest of their nitrogen. And then that nitrogen is supposed to carry the corn crop all the way through the rest of the growing season. However, you get a rainy period, all that nitrogen you put on at that time, some of it can be lost. So a lot of farmers, if they have what they consider a really high producing field that's capable of high yields, or if they feel like they've lost some of their nitrogen, they'll hire a crop duster to come in and apply dry nitrogen at tassel, uh, right when the corn is starting, to, is starting to make its ear corn and set yield. And uh, again, it's just to give it a give it a little bit a little bit of a boost to just uh, try and hoping you don't knock any of the any of the top end yield off. But anyway, I ho hope hope that answered your question satisfactory. Next question is is from Pete Parker. You're not Spider Man, are you? I'm just kidding. But he says as a, as a cotton grower in a very different climate, I'm curious about your chemical program from plant to picking. And I'm new to your channel, so I'm not sure do y'all irrigate. We have pivots and drip irrigation out here in the Texas desert. All right, uh, Pete, to uh, get to the second part of your question first, uh, no, we don't irrigate. Uh, as you can see, I mean, look at our field size. Right here, from here, all the way to the road, back where Zach is, is about 30-something acres. And it's kind of odd shape. Got a, got a tree line coming out that way, and it's kind of long and narrow. Uh, this is what our fields look like here in West Tennessee. And it's just, for most of our fields, it's just not feasible to dig a well and put an irrigation rig out there because it just can't cover enough of the field to make it pay for itself. You know, I think last I heard uh, here in West Tennessee, this has been a couple of years, prices might've gone up, but you, you can figure on, it costs about $1,000 an acre to, uh, to install an irrigation, irrigation rig and typically what farmers that have done it tell me, you need a minimum of, be, to be able to hunt, you need to be able to irrigate a minimum of 100 acres in a circle to make it cost effective. Now, I haven't run the numbers myself, but I do know that the, the fields we farm, we don't farm the bigger fields that some of our neighbors do. And when we farm what's left over, generally a hilly land, a land that's not all that good, and we try to rehabilitate it. That's kind of what we're known for and irrigation is not in our plans. Some years I'd love to, but then other years, uh, other years uh, we, have, uh, we have an average of 52 inches per rain here in West Tennessee. The last year, a few years, we've been getting more than that. And in a couple of years, some of those irrigation rigs that farmers just built in the last few years haven't even been turned on. So it's a headache I really don't want. What we're trying to do is to build our soil up to take full advantage of that 52 inches of rain that we get every year to whenever it does fall in the summer, to be able to infiltrate it down into the ground and then be able to store it. We're trying to do that through the use of no-till cover crops and manure to add carbon to the soil, build our organic matter up, and to build our soil structure up. As far as our chemical program, we're a little bit different than what, uh, than what our neighbors are. Uh, we try to do reduced uh, chemical inputs you know, just for the simple fact, we're trying to do it more of a natural way. Now, I'm not a hippie organic person. I'm not. I believe you do need some synthetic inputs. But I also believe that the more synthetic inputs you can cut out, the better you will be. So by using, uh, you know, our cover crops, we try to use our cover crops as a... Uh, as an additional weed control method to smother out any weeds that are coming up. But just to be upfront, our, our whole chemical program on all of our crops for the last between five and 10 years has revolved around one weed and one weed only, and that's Palmer amaranth, pigweed. I spend a lot of money on chemicals just for that one weed, just to try to minimize how many come up and how many they have to hand remove throughout, throughout the year. If we didn't have that weed, I could probably cut my herbicides in half. And as it is, because of my cover crops, I'd say I'm probably about $20 an acre cheaper on my chemical program than what other farmers are because I get such great residual control from my cover crops. But typically uh, our herbicide program is, is uh, uh, our first pass will typically be in, uh, in late, late March with Roundup with our hooded sprayer to band a strip in our cover crops to make it easy to plant into. Uh, our next uh, application will be uh, at planting. We'll come in with uh, with Paraquat 
in front of the roller crimper because the roller crimper will not terminate all of our cover crop species so we need the paraquat in there too. We'll do that at planting. Uh, immediately behind the sprayer we'll come by, come by with a roller crimper and then we'll do uh, and then we'll uh, and then we'll come back with a planter. And typically with that uh, paraquat application uh, we've become real fond of brake herbicide. It's an expensive herbicide and it takes a lot of rain to get it activated, but a lot of years it gives us really good control all season long, whereas other uh, chemicals that we've used, such as uh, Dyrex, Cotteran, Caprol, really only about a week or two uh, residual that they give you and then you got a flush of weeds coming up. Uh, after that, a couple weeks later, we'll come back, uh, usually when we're making a thrip application with acephate, we'll come uh, with, uh, with Roundup just to finish off the rest of the cover crop. Uh, if conditions are good, we might throw some dual in there too. Uh, and then if everything goes according to plan, we really only need one more herbicide application the rest of the year. And typically that will be with our hooded sprayer. We'll come uh, with probably, like this year we did Liberty and Dyrex underneath the hoods. But uh, this year was such a poor growing season. We had to make an additional herbicide application of just, just Roundup because the cotton was in such bad shape that we didn't want to put the dual in there and risk burning it. So as far as insects go, uh, like I said, uh, at the cod leading one, two leaf stage, uh, we're applying acephate. Normally we can, we can get by with one application of acephate. This year we had to make, uh, well, we actually had to use Intrepid Edge because the thrips were so bad and thrips are starting to become somewhat resistant to acephate. Uh, then uh, typically no more insects, uh, insect uh, app applications until we get to pin head to match head square then generally we'll come in with uh, centric to take care of uh, plant bugs and then uh, about three to four more times usually about every two weeks uh, when the cotton is blooming we'll come in and make a insecticide application like we're doing now uh, right now we're applying transform and diamond two weeks ago we came in with transform and acephate uh, and probably in two more weeks was probably when we'll swap, probably switch to a prethroid, probably a bifenthrin is probably what, what we'll use. So I'd say we got, we definitely got at least one more insecticide application, most likely two, hopefully not three more insect applications. All right, here comes Zach to fill up. Let me get him filled up and then uh, we'll get back going again. All right, Pete, where was that at? Uh, like I said, we probably got, uh, Two more insecticide applications is because the cotton just hasn't grown very hot this year. Normally we'd only have probably one more application this year, probably gonna take two. Now after uh, cotton is laid by all insects, you know, we'll make our last application will obviously be a uh, defoliant. We'll make, generally most years, we'll make two passes of defoliant. We'll start out with uh, some Folex and usually thiazuron uh, along with uh, probably probably some finish pro six and then we'll make our second application with probably uh, uh, folex and, and ethophon and then the uh, cotton's ready to harvest so uh, no it's a pretty long answer hope that uh, answered all the, all the questions you had there uh, next question uh, Bob Crone, you asked an awesome question about why uh, don't we uh, mow board prowl anymore and that's going to be a long-winded answer for me because that's talking about the soil and as y'all know i'm very passionate about the soil so i'll try to remember i'll start off the episode three with that question that's a great one but this video is already getting pretty long and i want to skip to ones that are going to be a little bit shorter all right uh david uh, McElwain asks do i ever just use wheat as a cover crop uh no i don't ever use just wheat as a cover crop and in fact, I try not to use wheat as a cover crop at all for the simple fact that I use, I grow wheat as a cash crop and I don't want to use the same plant that I use for a cash crop as a cover crop because, I mean, there's certain disease cycles, uh, there's, uh, you know, pest cycles that I don't want to introduce in my field unless I'm going to be actually harvesting it. So since we harvest wheat, we grow it on most of our ground once every three years. When I'm growing a cover, cover crop, I want different species of plants to do different things to the soil. Uh, and I've, if I'm actually planting a cover crop, 
I don't ever plant just one species. I'll, at the very minimum, I'll have three species. A lot of times we may have seven, eight, or nine different species in there, and each of them has a specific purpose. And also the other reason is, is I just don't think wheat is a very good cover crop. There's other grass alternatives out there that I think are much better than wheat that offer a lot more benefits than what wheat does. Yeah, wheat is a cheap cover crop to grow because the seed really doesn't cost that much, but as far as uh, agronomically, it just doesn't have a real deep root system. It's not gonna go really deep down into the ground. It's not gonna, uh, you know, just like your cereal rye or your annual rye grass, also, as far as organic matter, it doesn't grow as tall, so you're uh, sequestering less carbon up there on top of the soil, and it doesn't have, uh, and it, uh, it also doesn't put out a chemical like cereal rye does that prevents a lot of other weeds from germinating. So, wheat's not a bad cover crop. If that's all you got and you want something simple, easy, and cheap, wheat's fine. Myself, I want more out of our cover crop because we only got a limited amount of time that we can plant cover crops and I want to maximize the benefit I get every time I do plant a cover crop, and that's why we don't use wheat. All right, well, let Zach uh, pass by here. He's about to spray the end row. All right, the next question is from uh, John Hale. He says, uh, do I plan on outfitting the water truck with a fire hose nozzle type hose just in case you get a fire like what almost happened to the cotton picker last year? John, I'm way ahead of you. Will this work? Uh, actually, when we had this water truck uh, built, uh, it was a, just a suggestion of the of the company that I hired to build it to just have this made up and throw it on there because you never know when it'll come in handy. So we're here on the water truck right now. So uh, you want a demonstration of it? Well, there you can go. As you can tell, we got a fire hose. Shoot up a stream, shoot out a stream of water a long ways. But uh, the problem is, when we're picking cotton or harvesting with our combine, we typically don't have this truck out in the field because this is our spray truck and we're not doing any spraying at that time. And we, during harvest, we got enough equipment to move between fields that we typically don't uh, have have this uh, have this out in the out in the field. Uh, now, when we're picking cotton, we do have our water wagon out there that we used to fill the cotton picker up with water. And if you remember from our fire video on the cotton picker last year, you know, Zach was able to get it out there in short order. And it won't see, shoot a stream of water like that, but it was enough to uh, put out the fire. But typically, when you have a fire on a harvest machine, whether it be a combine or a cotton picker, it don't matter if you got a fire truck in the field or not. It's just... Uh, there's so many there's so many combustible things on that equipment that if you have a bad enough fire starting out it, it goes up just like that and a lot of times there's not much you can do to save it luckily we were fortunate we had a smoldering fire and we were able to put it out quickly with a fire extinguisher and the water wagon but not everybody gets that lucky most of the time all right last question for this video is from robert thomas he asks how many acres do i farm uh, total ground uh, farms that we work this year is 1,600 acres. Last year was the, our high point. We had right at 2,000 acres, but this off season, I lost our biggest and our best farm because the uh, landowner who used to farm it up until 2007 decided he wanted to try his hand at farming it again. So can't fault the guy for that, but that was a pretty tough pill to swallow. You know, we lost... 380 acres off of that farm 
Uh, there was a small uh, 15, 20 acre farm that I gave up that was, it was in Jackson, had to actually drive down a, a major uh, highway and go through a subdivision to get to it. And it was slowly being subdivided. And the uh, previous winter, they taken in another uh, section of land off that. And it just wasn't, it wasn't worth the danger of, in the trouble of getting over there to farm in it. So I gave that farm up. So that puts us around 1600 acres this year. There was another farm that the landlord told me they had sold, but something fell through and didn't get sold. It was about 50 acres, so I've got it for one more year, but I'll probably lose it after this year. Now, if you want to talk about total acres work, because we double crop a lot of our our, our ground, that puts us up close to, uh, uh, actually that puts us uh, up close to 2,100 acres total because we got 470 acres that we had wheat on and we now have soybeans on. So, you know, total planted acres this year is around 2,100, but that comes off 1,600 actual physical acres. And then last year we had, well, you count our, you count our double crop acres, we had, it was uh, right around 2,500 actual planted acres off 2,000 physical acres. So I know to some people that sounds like a lot, like, wow, you're a big farmer. No, I'm not a big farmer. I'm a pretty small farmer for our area. A big farmer in our area is 3,000 acres and above with several farmers in the area being up around six, seven, 8,000 acres. Thing is, I don't wanna be a big farmer. Ideally, I'd like to get probably up there between 2,000 and 2,500 physical acres if I could have them in bigger fields. The smaller fields that we work now, I can't handle that much with my management style. I'm extremely hands-on. I'm very, very particular about every detail of the operation. I wanna be able to physically look at every single acre uh, and determine what's best for it. And I get any bigger than that and there's just not enough of me to go around and farm it the way I want to. I'd have to cut some corners and I'm not gonna cut the corners. Uh, you know, for one thing, I'm not, my landlords depend on me to make the best possible crop that I can. And if I've got my sales spread too thin, some of those acres are going to suffer and that's a valuable asset for the landlord that they're not going to be making as much profit off of as possible. And I really feel responsible for making my landlords as much money as possible. So I think about 22 to 2,500 acres, if I could get some bigger fields that are a little bit easier to farm would be about the max that I would want to do. But where we actually started out at when I took over the farm in 2005, in the middle of the year when my father suddenly passed away, we were only working about 900 acres then. And over the time since then, you know, I've been able to slowly build it up. Uh, I haven't taken every piece of land that's been offered to me. There's a particular type of landlord I'm looking for. I'm not looking for a landlord who's just looking for the highest cash rent because I'm not going to pay it. I want a landlord who recognizes they have a valuable asset out there and they want that asset managed properly and they want they want to build that asset up and get the maximum value for it and that's what i specialize in so that's the type of landlord that we're looking at i don't want to be the biggest i do want to be the best and that's what i strive to do every day anyway uh i think that's definitely got us enough content for for this video really appreciate the questions i just i can't compliment y'all enough on the really intelligent questions that y'all are asking, questions that I really have never thought to answer in our regular regular videos. I hope y'all found this informative. If you're just now tuning into this and you got your own question, be sure to leave it in the comments. I'll get to it as soon as, soon as possible, but I love doing these types of videos. I love educating everybody about what we do, getting the actual facts and the truth out there. I know there's a lot of stuff in the media out there that portrays us as just being greedy, wanting to make all the money we can, not caring about the product and just drenching our crops in pesticides and don't care about the environment. And I want to put all of those uh, rumors to bed that it's not true. So, uh, I mean, education is our biggest goal with our channel and uh, this type of programming I really love to do. So, Anyway, appreciate y'all watching. Stay tuned. We'll be back with another one here real soon. We got a lot more questions to get through.